Welcome to the cookhouse of the Martha's Vineyard Museum. As always, when you enter one of these older buildings, you're going through a time warp. Right now, you've gone back 200 years. You are in a state-of-the-art 1815 summer kitchen. Take a look around. This is the state of technology. On the one wall is an open fireplace, which was the cook stove. Now that sounds like hardship, but if you project a nice fire in there, you know already, you can grill your fish, you can grill your meat, no problem with that. The hooks inside that fireplace will suspend pots, kettles, probably kettles with a round bottom because the heat will wrap around them and they boil faster. And once you have boiling water, there's gruel, there's tea, or other things you make with boiling water. The only problem, if it is one, is baking. Now there is no bake oven around here, and when this summer kitchen was added, there was no bakery on the island. Does this mean that the Cook family was sentenced to a diet of ship's biscuit with weevils? No. Uh, the answer is a Dutch oven. You know, these black cast iron pots about a foot and a half in diameter, but at that time they did have a metal lid because you put your dough, you put your batter in there, bury it in the embers and wait, oh, 40 minutes and you have pan bread. Good stuff. The only thing you cannot make in a Dutch oven is pie. But I assure you, you can make wicked cobblers. When you look around in here, you may notice that the paint scheme is somewhat muted. Sort of pale greens, off beiges, and I really don't know how to describe the color of the floorboards. But these are the old original colors, not the paint. The museum had a grant from a paint manufacturer to restore the old paintwork, but the, the color scheme is original. Also, when you look down on the floorboards, especially when you look against the light, you may notice modern mill marks, cuts sort of close together. And they indicate that these boards were cut by a sawmill. Now, we don't know whether it was driven by a water wheel or a steam engine or old Fred's Model T engine. We don't know that, but it was not hand cut. You also may notice when you look down that there are two kinds of nails. Nails with a triangular head, these are the old ones. And from a housekeeping point of view, they have an advantage. The shaft of these nails is coarse, uneven, and once they're in, they stay. Modern nails have a smooth shaft and they have to be redriven at some intervals to stay out of the way. Also what you see is an open beam that we left uncovered because it shows a construction principle. It is about 16 feet from the points of suspension and that is about the longest stretch you can have on a beam without a support that will not bow visibly. It bows a little bit, about an inch, if you look closely. And of course it helps that we don't put a piano on top. Also what you see here is the windows with those very small panes. Now that was because glass was produced that way. It was, it's handmade glass. It's quite soft, by the way. Uh, what happened is the glass was blown into a cylinder-shaped form which was then clipped open and the flat piece of glass inside was left to cool down on either metal or a stone slab. And sometimes it didn't cool evenly and that's why you have these distortions and things that look like faults in the glass. Well, they are, but they are old. On one window pane, you also have a scratched in signature by, by a Mr. Pease. Now, we don't know whether he was a visitor or one of the later owners of the house, but it is still there. Please do not imitate Mr. Pease. Behind me 
is the old outside door to the house. Four planks, very plain, with good iron hardware, and if we keep the rust away, it'll last forever. When we enter this room through the old outside door, you noticed that the door is quite low. Now, this is not because people were so much shorter. It is an energy conservation system because this room, the old kitchen, was known as the keeping room. This was where the family stayed most of the time between the end of October and May. It was the only room in the house that was heated 24-7 and uh, the rooms to the sides of this keeping room were meant for people who needed a little, a little extra comfort, warmth, uh, old people, children, pregnant women and so forth. Now when you came in here you may have noticed that the floor is tilted. The original keeping room did not have a wooden floor, it had a dirt floor. Now that sounds uh, kind of stark, but it has several advantages. First, it's fireproof. And when the fire was going 24-7, you would have to be wary of sparks flying. The other point is that uh, you could even out the tilting of the floor. You had a level floor here. And also, if it got too scuzzy, you could scrape the top layer off, cart it away, and have a new floor. The house was built, as far as we can tell, roughly in 1732 by a man who called himself uh, Temple Philip Cook. Now, Mr. Cook is a man of mystery. We have an indication that he was born in England in 1704, and he came to the island in the early 1720s. Local tradition has it that he was the first lawyer on the island, but research has failed to turn up any law degree with his name on it. Now, whether he changed his name when he came to America, for reasons that you can speculate on. Did he run away from a client? Did he take the client's money? Was he in political trouble or religious trouble? All that is possible. Or the other possibility, and I personally lean to that second possibility, is that he trained as a lawyer but never got a degree. He had legal training. We know that from the documents in the courthouse. Now, Mr. Cook got married. Uh, the exact details, whether it was a girl with the last name Coffin or some other people say she was uh, a Daggett, we are not 100% sure, but there were children, uh, about half a dozen of them. And one of the children, the son, did indeed have a law degree and got appointed judge in Dukes County and uh, served as a judge. He didn't like the, uh, to have whole court in, in the taverns, with dirt floors, smelly places, noisy. He decided to have court here in his home and we'll see his courtroom in a moment. The construction details in the keeping room are quite nice for the age. They date to the early part of the 18th century there is some details in the beams and posters that indicate that the house probably was built with some recycled materials. By recycled materials, I mean items from all the structures that were put into service here. Because we have to remember that by 1780, there was no forest left on this island. It was clear cut. And if you look at the paneling on either side of the room that screened off the smaller rooms, the nicely paneled wood, uh, wood, you see they're quite wide. So this must have been substantial trees to cut panels this wide. Now this room here, after the darkness of the keeping room, is quite different. And what you see behind me 
and on the, on the other walls is the decoration that the judge had put in in 1750 to make his courtroom a little bit more formal. Now, what you see behind me is my favorite seasick door. There is no right angle and the carpenters had no problems with this. They were ships, shipbuilders. They knew how to deal with odd angles and twists and turns and came out to make it decent. Now the wall behind me sort of looks like a ship's bulkhead. They made the best what they could with a house that already in 1750, 20 years after it had been built, had tilted already. Now the house is built around a brick core and especially on the lower floor it's very visible, the floors tilt outwards. And the floorboards that you see on the ground floor all are more or less recent. There is no foundation, the sills sit directly on dirt. There is, however, a root cellar and there is a legend combined with that root cellar. I'll speak about that in a moment. But when the floorboards had to be replaced, uh, the museum felt this would be a good opportunity to investigate the ground underneath. That's where stuff ends up. And basically there were three layers. A first layer where the sand and dirt in general was the way the glaciers had deposited 18,000 years ago, nothing in it. The next layer up, the usual, Indian artifacts, arrowheads, spearheads, some tools. And on a top layer, stuff from the settlers. And the cabinets in this room, these glass cases, show a sampler of about the 6,000 objects that came out of the ground. Uh, it's a rather strange collection, but all of a sudden an image of the Cook family comes up. Namely, they were not poor. First, although that's not necessarily an indication of richness, there's a toothbrush. Unusual for the 18th century, just remember the trouble that President Washington had with his teeth. Next to it, fragments of a porcelain doll. Now, I'm sure that little girl cried her eyes out when her doll broke. A porcelain doll was not only something very special, it also was probably expensive. Normal at that time were rag dolls. But more telling uh, are those little blobs of fabric on the left side of that glass cube. They're remnants of silk rags. Silk rags? Well, you can't go down Main Street and buy silk rags. Number one, the hardware store is gone. Number two, you don't buy silk rags. Somebody in the family had silk clothing. Now, we don't know whether it was a man's shirt or women's clothing, but in Yankee tradition, it was being used up. Silk clothing was expensive. Now, you may wonder why the furniture hardware ended up in the throwaway dirt. Well. The problem is probably that it was from furniture infested with powder post beetles. Only modern chemistry can get a handle on those. At that time, the only way to keep, keep it from spreading further was to burn it. And some of the hardware probably went into the fireplace with it. Remember, wood was at a premium. And this way you could combine the agreeable with the useful. But also, the hint about money in the family is further highlighting what we found in the other two cabinets on the west wall. Fragments of dishes. Now it shows quite clearly that the family had three sets of dishes. First, earthenware, coarse stuff, utilitarian stuff, including a gin bottle and water jugs. The house never ever had running water. Every drop of water to be used in this house had to be brought in and carried out. I don't think the family threw dirty water out their windows. Next, porcelain for everyday wear. Mocha wear, salt lace wear, coarse stuff but very useful. And then, China. And that ties into something that we know from the family. One of the grandsons of the builder was a captain in the China trade. 
China trade meant that items from the Northeast, predominantly furs, beaver pelts above all, and deer antlers were exported to China and traded for porcelain. That's why we call it China. Um, by the way, a trip from New Bedford to the treaty ports where the trading took place uh, took about 200 days around Cape Horn because the Panama Canal was not yet open. If they didn't make it around Cape Horn, had to go around Africa, you can easily add another 50 days. So it was not an easy trip. And what was brought back was very useful, not terribly high class, if you will, stuff, but plain porcelain, plates, saucers, small plates, and so forth. Most of it in pink, some of it in blue. And I'm sure the captain bought, traded for his own use, a barrel full of this stuff, and some of the fragments ended up underneath the house after it broke. Now, how do we know it was from the period? Well, on one wall, you see a clay pipe and fragments. Now, the staff ran something like a carbon test, determining the age of these clay pipes and they all came from the period about 1760 to 1770. And that's a very good indication when they were broken and ended up there. And this is a hint onto the timeline. We are now uh, just inside of the main door of the house. Uh, now, in good old New England tradition, the back door, the one that we entered into the keeping room, is the door that was normally used. The front door of the house basically serves two purposes. Nowadays, it would be bad news and UPS. At the time, we're talking now the early part of the 19th century, the family had undergone a change. That is, one of the descendants of the builder of the house took a job with the federal government. He was customs collector. Uh, the Customs Service was established by executive order of President Washington in 1781. And this, together with the whiskey tax, was the source of the source of income for the federal government for the following 100 years. The system worked quite well. I just point to the fact that the Louisiana Purchase, the Gadsden Purchase, and Seward's Folly, known as Alaska, was financed from that income. The whiskey tax didn't bring that much. Now, the younger cook, as a customs collector, had his office upstairs. And since the sea captains were coming on an official visit, they came through the front door. Uh, it looks like the property is very narrow at this point, but there is a right of way where they could have maybe even drawn up in a carriage. And they went up these stairs. And if you look at the floorboards upstairs, you could see where they stood and shuffled. Do we really have to pay cash for this? Yes, the ledger will tell you. Now, if you look at the staircase, this is a rather standard staircase for the period. Uh, there are several like it here in Edgar Town and all over Massachusetts and Connecticut. But what makes, uh, what makes it unusual is, number one, there is this very heavy-duty hook you see on my right. Now, this is not for visitors' coats or the visitors if they were disliked. It held a fire bucket. In a central location in the house, it was a leather bucket filled with, no, with sand. You don't want to pour water on a fire because you're just spreading it. Also on my right is a little door, and this gave rise to the local myth that the root cellar was used by the judge as his dungeon. So they could bring the defendants up this staircase. Well, I would not fit through there. A child would. And knowing the microeconomics of a household of the period, it was absolutely correct. The children were important in running the microeconomics of the household. They were the ones who brought in and took out the water, the firewood, the ashes and generally were the gophers for kitchen stuff and so forth. The stairway is very narrow and very steep and an adult, even a small one, 
the slight bit hesitant and encouraged by a bailiff would simply not fit through here. The Cook family moved out of this house in 1851. And unfortunately for us and for you, they took all their possessions with them. Their furniture, carpets if they had them, bedding, wall hangings, pictures, documents. So in this sense, the Cook House is not a historical house showing exactly the way it was when the Cook family was in here. On the other hand, the museum, like most museums in the world, has more stuff than it can possibly show, including quite a bit of Victorian or 19th century furniture and materials, stuff. And therefore, this parlor is furnished in the style of about 1860. And when you look around, you see a table piano. No, it cannot play anymore. The moisture got to it. Uh, the furniture looks awfully dark. It originally was not this dark. The wood has darkened because it was finished with linseed oil and that oxidizes black. The upholstery on the sofa, on the settee and on that chair probably was dark red, but time has changed it to this, this black. The picture on the wall is not a member of the Cook family. Uh, as I said, we don't have any pictures except one old lady. Also here on display are things that the sailing members of the family or of the community would bring back from trips here uh, from the Pacific. You see two ceremonial paddles, you see uh, exciting large, uh, large seashells and an interesting looking nut. I'm told it's the largest one in the world. Uh, all items that would be brought home and shown to the family and displayed for visitors. And this was sort of what went on in these formal parlors. It was for formal visits. Friends came through the back door and had tea with the family in the kitchen.